Arabian horses are trained rigorously in the Middle Eastern deserts. Um, these horses must learn to fully obey their masters. This obedience is tested by depriving these horses in the Middle Eastern desert of water. Um, they, are, they are then turned loose near a water source. And as the horses get to the edge of the water, the trainer blows the whistle that he's been trained, this horse has been trained with all along. And the horse has to stop, turn around, and go back before it's allowed to have a drink of water. If the horses have learned to obey, they then are given as much water as they need. The trainer knows what his horses need and will not allow them to die of thirst. But they must learn to trust their trainer. Obedience is one of the hardest things that we learn in this life. Amen? Does anybody like to be obedient? Just for your... Like a couple of kids are like, yes, I do. Now can we go eat pizza? So... We are taught from a young age that we must be obedient in order to stay out of trouble, right? Kids in the room, why are you obedient? So you don't get in trouble. I don't like swats. I don't like timeout. I don't like any of those things. But the truth is learning to be obedient is less about staying out of trouble and more about us having our very best life. Now, parents, I know that we try our best to teach our kids to be obedient, right? Right? I mean, that's our goal. We redirect or we discipline in order to get the desired result for our child. In our jobs, how many of you in here have a job? Raise your hand. In our jobs, we follow the rules or we're supposed to follow the rules and do as we are instructed and that allows us to go further in our career. Today, we're continuing on in our series as we look at the book of Ephesians. Paul was writing to the newly formed church in Ephesus, and he was giving them instructions on how to live, how to live in Christ while still being in the world. That's probably the hardest thing that we do as followers, learning how to be like Jesus in a world that needs Jesus. So we spent last week talking about the role that husbands and wives play. Today we're going to continue on in the section that we're in, and many people refer to even last week, including into this week, these are called household code, or they're rules for living. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 today. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to flip over there. If you have your smart devices, you can get on the YouVersion app. If you have that, you can look up Ephesians 6, or you can church, search for First Christian Church of Heron under the Live tab, and all of your notes will be right there, okay? If you don't have any of those things, everything will be up on the screen this morning, all right? So before we jump in, I just want to invite you to join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word God, your word is powerful and effective. It teaches us everything that we need to know how to live this life the best way. So God, today, as we discuss this idea of learning to be obedient in our lives, may we really truly begin to grasp what it means to do that, to be obedient to your word, to be obedient to those in authority. God, even to be obedient to the things that we don't want to be obedient to. But God, Train us, teach us, so that we might be the best that we can be for your kingdom. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want us to start today by going back. And last week we discussed what I believe is the most important idea and the most important command that makes all of this household code that we're talking about livable. It makes this the easiest way to do things. And this whole idea is based in one word. Has anybody got any ideas what it is? Submission. Submission. We're going to look back at Ephesians 5.21. This is what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is where all this good living starts. The truth is, is if husbands and wives would submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, if children would submit to their parents out of reverence for Christ, if those in the workforce would submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to have a pretty good world, aren't we? The truth is, is oftentimes we don't submit because we get stuck in this rut of wanting it our way to do the things that we want to make us happy. Submission is actually about putting the other person's interests ahead of your own. So today, we're going to specifically take some time. We're going to talk about 
four different groups of people, okay? We're going to talk to children. We're going to talk to fathers. We're going to talk to workers. And we're going to talk to bosses. All right? So here's the thing. If you don't fall into one of these categories, then you can just take a nap. Just kidding. No napping. At least just don't snore, okay? That's, if they start to snore, give them an elbow, okay? The principles here that we're going to talk about, they really are not just for those four groups. They actually are going to guide all of us in positive ways, okay? So we're going to talk about this idea of obedience. So we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to pick up in verse 1, and it says this. Children. So who is he talking to? Children. Kids that live in homes that have parents. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Parents, are you ready to, you guys like this? Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. This idea of obey, it has a lot of deep meaning. It's actually deeper than what we see it on the surface, okay? And when we look up the word define, of obey, it's defined like this, to follow, to be subject to, or to listen to. In other words, when Paul says that children should obey their parents, he's saying this. Are you ready? You ready, children? You want to know what Paul's saying? He's saying, obey your parents. Right? Everybody got really quiet. Do what they say. Follow their instructions. But he doesn't just say this, okay? He doesn't just say it to say it. He, he actually is saying it because there are some ramifications if you don't. Now, kids, they're in the room this morning. All my students that are in here this morning. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever disobeyed your parents? Just raise your hand. How's that working for you? Not very good, right? How many of you, so let's, just, let's really get honest here. How many of you have ever disobeyed your parents and then found out later that disobeying your parents was really stupid? Has anybody ever done that before? Yeah. So let me tell you something, okay? I just want to throw this out there, okay? Students, your parents are not as stupid as you think they are. Okay? Once you get to be about 20, you'll start going, Man, my mom and dad are not really that dumb. They might actually know what they're talking about. See, Paul says that the first thing he says is that we need to do this because it is right. See, we are placed under the authority of our parents by God so they can raise us and teach us the ways of God. He says that this is the first commandment with a promise. Well, where does this come from? This actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16. And it's, this is what it says. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It, it literally says, obey your parents so that you can live a long life. Do you know why that is? It's because of what your mom always said. I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. But that's not the only reason. It doesn't even just stop there. If we look in, in Exodus, in the Old Testament, there were punishments for children that didn't obey their parents. Now, I want to tell you something, okay, kids? If you think your punishments are bad, we're about to read what bad punishments look like. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 21 in verse 15, it says this, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be what? Put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. No, you're not going to get your cell phone taken away. You're going to die. And the thing is, is God didn't just stop there. He went on to tell them actually how to do this in very specific ways. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, if a child is disobedient, this is what they were supposed to do. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, girls don't think you get out of this. We can throw girls in there too. 
If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son or daughter who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of this city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Now catch this. Then all of the men in the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear it and fear it. Whew. I mean, sounds kind of rough, right? See, you actually have it pretty easy if you just get grounded from your Xbox or your cell phone. See, there's a reason that this happens. I really began to ask myself why God was so harsh when it came to disobedience this week, okay? And it hit me really hard. You want to know why? When a child dishonors their parents, they are dishonoring God. That's why. When a child dishonors their parents, they are dishonoring God. I want to explain this, okay? Your parents are placed in authority by God. You were born to your family because that's the way that God intended it to be. When we do not show the proper respect to them, it is a sin. Just like when we live in direct opposition to God's word, it's a sin. Here, here's one of the problems that we have today, parents. And parents, I want to talk specifically to you. And some of you are not going to like what I'm about to say. But I just have to be brutally honest with you. Um, I, I don't really care if you like what I'm about to say because it's true. Parents, we have got to stop trying to be our kids' best friends and we have got to start disciplining our children. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be hard. I'm saying that because we are living in a world that is so hard. I mean, I hear stories of things that go on in our school systems. I hear stories about things that are happening in, in, at parties and in, in locker rooms. And the truth is this, if we as parents don't discipline our kids and train them up the way that they should live, then we're going to lose them. I grew up in a home that was, well, I got yelled at a lot. I mean a lot, okay? And I've tried to change some of that in my home. I'm not always good at it. But I got yelled at a lot as a kid. I got disciplined as a kid. And, and today I stand here before you as a man that's 41 years old and I thank God that my parents disciplined me. Many of you parents sit in this room today and you are where you are because your parents took the time to discipline you and to love you in that discipline. Too often we are trying so hard in today's culture for some reason to be so concerned about our children's happiness that we're not training them up to be godly men and women. If you want to be your kid's best friend, learn to discipline them with love. And then when they get older, you will be their best friend. One of my best friends in my life today is my dad. And he used to discipline me. We have got to get back to a point where we understand that true discipline is the way that God intended it. See, here's the thing. Children obey authority as they watch their parents obey authority. How are you doing as parents? Children obey authority as they watch their parents obey authority. How are you doing? The old do as I say, not as I do I did, it does not work anymore. When we as parents model honor as a lifestyle, our children will see it and begin to emulate it in their lives as well. If you're constantly talking negatively about your student's teacher at school, then guess what your student's going to do when they're at school? They're going to treat their teacher the way you've talked about them at home. Or maybe it's their boss. Or maybe it's another parent. Or maybe it's a coach. See, here's the thing. We must understand that as parents, we're teaching our kids with everything that we do and with every word that we say. Solomon had a lot to say about how 
children should listen to their parents. Listen to what he says in Proverbs 1.8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Proverbs 6, he says again, My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. Parents, we have a hard job. I will tell you the things that my kids deal with today and that your kids deal with today, I never would have thought that those are the things that, that, that they're dealing with. I had somebody come into me this, just this week and they began to tell me that they're having struggles at school because their, their children are confused because they dress like a girl and act like a girl and talk like a girl, but they have a boy's name and they don't know how to handle that. We have to continue to teach truth. And there's going to be confusing things that happen. And there's going to be conversations that are going to happen. And there's going to be lifestyles that are lived. And we should be grounding our kids in God's word. Because that's the only way we're going to make it through this. But students, I want to talk specifically to you for just a second. Listen, okay? All of you students in this room, your eyes need to be on me. Because I'm going to say this to you. Your parents have a lot of wisdom. And most of it has probably been earned and learned in the school of hard knocks. Trust them. Honor them. Obey them. Because the truth of the matter is, you may not see it right now, and you may not think it right now, and you may not know it right now, but your parents have your best interests at heart. Do what they ask you to do. And then know that what it says in Deuteronomy 5 is true. Honor your father and mother, you may live a long life. Okay? And then Paul continues on in Ephesians 6, and he actually talks to fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Paul is telling fathers in particular not to ride your kids so hard they become overwhelmed. That's really what he's talking about here. And we want the best for our kids, right? Dads, can I ask you a question? Do you want the best for your kids? This is where you answer. Yes. I hope you say yes. Dads, we want the best for our kids, right? But we often go about trying to get that from them the wrong way. You ever done that? Oh, now nobody wants to talk now when you ask the question. See, here's what happens. We as dads oftentimes spend a lot of time focusing on our career and things outside of the home. We're not as involved as we would like to be and possibly as we should be. And so what we do to try to make up for it is, is we ride that horse. We stay on our children. Now, can we just have a confessional moment? Has there any dads ever in their life ever done that? Just with a raise of your hand. You ever been on your kid too hard? Got a couple of honest dads in the room, so... It's something we struggle with. Some of it is because as dads, we want our kids to do better than we did, right? We want what's best for them. We want to do what's best for them. Here's the problem. If all we ever do is stay on them, they are never going to listen to us. We provoke them to become angry, and anger is not the result we're looking for. The thing I want to encourage you is this. You have to find that, that happy place where your career doesn't overtake your ability to raise your kids well, okay? I read a story this week, and it broke my heart. A well-known biblical scholar invited Dr. Ch uh, Charles Quarles to lunch one day. Dr. Quarles told him, the scholar, that he was extremely inspired by his productivity as a thinker and a writer, and he went on to say, I'm amazed by your work. How did you manage to be so prolific? This theological heavyweight mumbled something under his breath. I sacrificed my son. He was stunned by his words, and Dr. Quirrell said he, he thought he misunderstood him, so he asked him again, what did you say? And the scholar replied, almost in an angry tone, you heard me, I sacrificed my son. Dr. Quarles said, said the scholar added that he had been so driven to research and to publish and make a name for himself in the academic world that he neglected his family. 
His son essentially grew up as a stranger to his father. Now as an adult, his son was a homeless man sleeping on the streets. Dr. Quarles tried to comfort him, and he said, I'm sure that's not your fault. And even more angrily, the scholar replied, don't try to console me. Yes, I did that. Even though people seem amazed by my productivity as a scholar, the fact is I would give up every one of those books and far, far more just to have my son back. Then this prolific writer looked across the table straight into the eyes of Dr. Quarles, and he said, just in case you want to walk in my footsteps... Know that I pray to God that you won't. Dad, our jobs are never worth losing our kids. See, our number one objective is to train our children to know and love Jesus. If we teach them to do that, we have done our duty as parents. That is our number one job. And I'm going to tell you, it's tough. Being a parent is not easy. Can I get an amen on that one? It is hard. Kids, being a kid is not easy. Amen? Amen. amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quit playing your video game over there and pay attention. He just, he knew he got to get loud in church, so. <laughs> yeah. He's pointing at his brother. <laughs> Love you, buddy. It's tough. But the truth is, is if we go back to Ephesians 5.21, if we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, then guess what happens? It's not so hard. So I want to talk a little bit about this last section before we jump in, okay? Paul specifically in this last section is actually talking about slavery. And I just want to throw this out there, okay? I am by no means minimizing slavery, all right? I want to say that up front. I think there's a lot of principles in this last little piece of this section of Scripture that give us some good ideas and some good things that we can do as workers that have jobs, as well as bosses that have workers under them. But I want to say this. Slavery is real. I don't want to minimize or undermine it. I believe when Paul wrote this section of Scripture, his, his goal was not to overthrow the Roman government. And if you go and you look at what was going on in history at their time, there were actually 60 million slaves in the, Roman, in the Roman world at the time. Now understand this. A lot of those 60 million were actually bond servants. And what a bond servant was, was actually somebody that volunteered to be a servant under someone. Some of those servants were actually people that had committed crimes and they were in servitude to pay for their crimes. They had stolen from someone, they had borrowed money and were not, unable to pay it back. And so they lived a life of servitude until they did pay it back. And what's interesting is the way that, servant, that servitude was different then as it is now or it has been in the, in the rec not so recent past, was that you could actually be a servant, you could be a bond servant or a slave, and you could actually work and save money until you were able to free yourself from that, that servitude and become something of yourself. The reason I don't want to downplay slavery is because if you don't believe that it is real and it is still happening today, then you need to open your eyes. There are thousands upon ten thousands upon hundreds of thousands of slaves in the world today. Many of them are stuck in the sex industry. So don't by any stretch of the imagination believe that I am trying to say that slavery is not a big deal because it is. And if you don't think it happens, then I want to encourage you to drive over here to Marion, to the Flying J on a Friday night, and see what goes on at the trucks behind the truck stop. It's real. And I don't want to minimize it. And if it makes you uncomfortable that I talked about it, then maybe you should pray about that and see if God's maybe not calling you to do something about it. But I don't want to downplay what Paul's talking about here, okay? But I do believe that this idea of how a bondservant or a slave should work for their master or their boss gives us a lot of really good principles to follow. So here's the thing. I want us to look at this 
as we conclude this section of Scripture and talk about how we can be good employees or good bosses, okay? So this is what it says in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service from a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever God, good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Here's the thing. Paul wants us to live as Christians even in our workplaces, there's this tendency sometimes for us as followers of Christ to think that if I go to my job, I take off my hat as a Christian and I can act however I want. The truth is, is the only way we're going to affect the world that we're a part of is by being who we're called to be everywhere we go. There should be no difference between how we live at work or outside of work. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 10 says. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I like that verse because I like to eat. So I'm going to start doing it for the glory of God. Just kidding. No more Krispy Kremes until tomorrow. But Paul wants us to see that our work is just as much for God as our play or our sleep or our eating or our drinking. See, all work is sacred if our mindset is right and true. And then he goes on to talk about eye service, okay? And this is something that we don't talk about. But what Paul specifically is talking about is, you know that guy you work with or that lady that you work with that they sit around and they're really lazy and they slack, but then all of a sudden they see the boss coming and they start to work really, really hard? Do you know that person? It ticks you off, right? They get good reviews because they kiss up to the boss or the boss's boss a lot. They're not really working hard. They're doing what Paul calls eye service. They're only working when they have to. There's no integrity in what they do. It's this idea of working hard when the boss is around and making them think you're a hard worker when in fact it's really just for show. It's kind of like this. In, in Bristol, England, there was a story that exposed some workers at an electronics factory there who'd been sleeping through the night shift for more than 16 years. Now, if that's not bad enough, listen to this. They worked on the night shift and they slept that way for 16 years. But this is the best part. They had fabricated secret bedrooms in the plant's walls and ceilings. They were only found out when outside contractors found some spare electrical cables and traced them through the ceiling and behind some sliding hatches to find reading lamps besides the beds in the hidden rooms. They also found secret compartments with mattresses and blankets and pillows and sheets and lamps and even alarm clocks because they didn't want to sleep through the end of their shift and get caught. At least three foremen knew about the workers' sleep-in shifts, but they were afraid to report them for fear of losing their jobs. That's giving eye service. See, the truth is, is as workers, we should be full of integrity when we do our jobs. Listen to what Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then skip down to verse 22, and it says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. The truth is, our work should be an extension of our love and service to Christ. When we do our job, we should do it all to the glory of God. When we work hard and we put in a long day's work and we leave that day and we lay our head on our pillow at night tired and exhausted, we should be able to say, I gave it all for the glory of God today and we should be able to sleep well. If we give of ourselves in our work, then we can know that God is honored. And the truth is, for those of you who are bosses in your job, if you have employees that work for you, the same should be said of you. Don't threaten your employees. 
Don't show partiality because someone schmoozes you. Do what is right according to God. This, this word master, actually, the root of the word master is actually the word doulos. And do you know what the word doulos means? Servant. Even as a supervisor in your job, your first job is to be a servant of the Lord. Treat your employees like God would want you to. And there's something I read this week. Did you know that it is actually a well-known fact that employees who are treated well work harder? So here's your challenge if you're, if you're, in, if you're, a, if you're a supervisor in your job. I want to challenge you to do something this week, okay? And maybe this is, maybe you've got to find a different way to do this. But serve your employees this week somehow. Bring donuts to work. Or cookies. Buy lunch. Write a thank you note to them for working hard for you. Be a servant. And watch what will happen. I make you a promise today. If you do that, your employees will look at you differently. They will work harder for you because they know that you respect them. See, here's the bottom line today. We've talked about all these different, uh, these, these different people. We've talked about children being obedient to their parents. We've talked about fathers being obedient to Christ. We've talked about workers being obedient to their bosses. We've even talked about bosses being obedient to um, their employees. See, the bottom line is this. When we are obedient to those in authority, we show the world who Christ is. Our witness can be the difference in the lives of those who need Jesus. See, here's the real truth. The real truth of the matter is this. We should be obedient because we are ultimately being obedient to Christ. No matter what we do, no matter where we are, no matter what job we have. The truth is, is if you clean porta potties for a living, then do it all for the glory of God. If you're a teacher, then do it all for the glory of God. Police officer, if, you, if you're a fireman, if you work in an office building, if you're retired, do it all for the glory of God. Be obedient to Christ and do it all for His glory, not your own. The truth is, is if we begin to become a people that believes that Ephesians 5.21 is true, and we begin to live like Ephesians 5.21 is true in us, if we begin to submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ, then guess what's going to happen? Our church is going to change. Our homes are going to change. Our marriages are going to change. Our interpersonal relationships with our children and our children's children are going to change. Our, our relationships with our community is going to change. Our relationships with the people in the world are going to change. And ultimately, everyone will come to know who Jesus is because it begins with us. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This morning we're going to sing this song. And, and I, I know that some of you came in here carrying heavy baggage today. Maybe there's some of you in here who are, who are, who are, parent, who's, who, who are children and you know that you have not been obedient to your parents. I want to encourage you to do something in this moment. If your parents are in here, I want to encourage you to love them and to pray with them right now and ask that you would begin to be a more obedient child and that your parent would have the ability to raise you in the way that God would want. Maybe you're in here today and you don't even know how to do that or what that looks like and you need somebody to come alongside you. Then we want you to come down for, we want to pray with you this morning. We don't want you to leave not knowing. Maybe this morning you've come here for the first time and you don't even really know that you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And you know what? I'm so glad that you are here today. 
because he loves you. And he died for you. And he wants to know you. Maybe you're dealing with other interpersonal struggles in your life and you don't even know what to do. We just want to invite you. We're going to sing this song. Myself, some of our elders, we're going to be down front. We just would love to pray with you. Can I just tell you something? Every person that has a struggle in their life struggles to overcome it when they try to do it alone. It is when we do it together that we find victory. Do you know why things like Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Celebrate Recovery and all those things are so successful? It's because they know that those people will never do it alone and so they have someone walk with them. The same can be true. So the same needs to be true in the church. Don't try to do it alone. Let us walk with you. We're going to sing this song. If you have a decision this morning, we want to invite you. Come down front. Let us pray with you as we stand right now and sing.